Welcome to episode 204 of Silver Lining for Learning. This is season five or year five of the show, about halfway through season five. The title of today's discussion is Migrant Education and Global Citizenship on the Thai-Myanmar Border. I'm heading to Thailand in a few weeks, actually. Uh, we'll be talking to Andrew Swindell, who spent 15 years working in international development, education, research in the area. Um, he's researched digital literacy. He's researched AI, actually. He's researched education and emergencies and curriculum studies. Um, he's a MERL person currently working in monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning, a consultant for an NGO in Thailand. And he can talk to us more about MERL um, in a few minutes. We also have with us Anita Chong, who's a part-time instructor for Meijo University in Northern Thailand. She, her dissertation was on multicultural education from Chiang Mai University. They first met up virtually, I'll talk about that, during COVID and then physically in Thailand. Um, and so the two of them will discuss the topic for today. And I'll start with Andrew. Could you give us a little bit more of your background, Andrew, and tell us uh, what led you into this project and your background in different countries, in particular in Thailand? Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for having us on. Really appreciate it. Um, love the podcast. So it's uh, it's really a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, so I moved to Thailand 12 years ago to work as an English teacher in a public school, uh, sort of in central Thailand, Phuket. Uh, the town was Dan Chang. I worked there for a couple of years, uh, and then I worked in Myanmar for two years at a international school, and that really got me started in the international education space. Uh, after that, I completed my PhD in international education at UCLA, and that's when I met up with uh, Juanita. We both had a, a mutual interest in global citizenship education, and we've been working together now for, yeah, over four years. But at the yeah, you know, my first time in Thailand was 12 years ago, and I've been working in and out of Thailand and Myanmar uh, since then. Your bio indicates a number of other countries that you've been involved with as well. Um, Bangladesh, <laughs> yep. Liberia. Um, yeah, my, my first job was at an international development um, company, and I was a program officer for a couple different projects in Liberia. Uh, that was yeah, 20, uh, 2009 to 2012, and I currently serve as an adjunct professor or adjunct instructor at the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh. So We've had I, them I advised, on the show. We've had yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I saw that. I, that was a great episode. Uh, so I advised a few of their MED students uh, on their, th their master's thesis research and taught a class on education and globalization. So yeah, nice to have that mutual connection too. I think that's how we got connected in LinkedIn because Stephanie Pinky is a mutual friend, I think, who works yeah, for and I was, And I was at the OLC for two years as an education researcher. So I'm still uh, an assistant editor of the OLJ. So I wasn't sure if it was from that or <laughs> AUW. But... Oh, for, you've been part of OLJ as well. Okay, great. Uh, uh, yep. So Juanita, can you expand a little bit on your background uh, and We'll start getting into the discussion after that. So um, my first degree was in education at Jalalongkorn University in Bangkok. I grew up, I was born and grew up in Bangkok, basically, you know, and then I pursued my master's degree at Jalalongkorn University as, as well. And, and then like I, I came to America for a little bit and then, you know, started to do my own business, but it's not really like education you know, um, based work, basically, I kind of like follow my, my parents dream, more than my own dream. So I decided to like go back to Thailand and then started to work for the university and become a lecturer for major university as a full time lecturer for like six, seven years. And then I had to leave because at that time, I was trying to pursue my PhD. And it was so tough to work full time, you know, and do PhD at the same time. So I'm kind of really new kid on the block here as far as the education field, you know, um, academic field. And so, and I was actually, while I was doing my PhD research on uh, global citizenship education on the border of Thailand and Myanmar, you know, I met with the um, 
the director of the local NGO, and she approached me. She said, Juanita, can you help me design the Thai curriculum that is actually inclusive and meaningful to the life of the migrant communities? You know, so I said, okay, who should I reach out? So I was reading the the, the uh, concept, the theories of global citizenship education um, written by Professor Torres, Carlos Torres. And, and then so I reached out to him and that's when he like connected me with Andrew. So that's how we met. And we started to work together on designing the curriculum. Gotcha. Well, I am trying my best to wear my Chula Longhorn outfit. They're the pink university. And I'll be there in six weeks giving a, a talk to English <laughs> professors there. Um, can you describe this, the, the issue or the, the, the significance of the problem that Thailand or Myanmar faces at the border? I mean, what, what kind of numbers are we talking about that might immigrate in? You know, do you have any sense of that or, or the scale of the number of students in schools that you're they're trying to address? I mean, how seamless are people moving between borders? Is it easy to cross borders? It's well, it, it used to be very easy to cross the border before the COVID-19 and also before the Myanmar, the coup, you know, the military coup in 2021, the beginning of February 2021, that's when Thailand started to close the border. So, you know, at that, that time, people were not able to really like cross border. They, they used to be like students could just walk you know, cross the border and come to school in Thailand, right? People, migrant workers used to walk, you know, walk across the street, across the bridge and come to work in Thailand. But nowadays it's not like that, you know, after, because of the conflicts in Myanmar. And uh, so, and then right now, Thailand has the education for all policy, even though we have that policy that anyone can access to education and we have 15 years free basic education, but Myanmar migrant students still have challenges to access to that education. You know, even though we have that policy, but it's not implemented um, in, the, in the school. So therefore we have about like 200,000 children who are not in school right now, um, which is a, a big number. And that number has never been decreased. Basically it's, it has been very stable, you know, so. Um, that's why I think there should be an assessment and, you know, evaluation for the education for our policy, you know, that we have been, you know, using in Thailand. 200,000 students, of, are, are, are those Thai and Burmese students or? The 200,000 number is actually just for the, but the migrant Myanmar. student. Oh, wow. Right. Wow. Juanita, I was going to say, do you know the total number of migrants roughly now in that region from Myanmar? Um, I can I can double check, but I kind of forgot. <laughs> I, I, just... I know it's it's hundreds of thousands. I don't know. I, I didn't know if it was in the million, you know, over a million now. But yeah, but but because remember, they are undocumented as well. So the number is not really like accurate, you know, even though we have the number. Um, yeah, but but still. So I just talked to the local um, director, the NGO, about the current situation of Myanmar conflicts right now, uh, what's going on with the migrant population. She said it has been a lot of, a big influx of migrant population, you know, coming to Thailand. Um, so we have the school system that we call um, migrant learning center, which is like an off, an official school, is not recognized by the Ministry of Education in Thailand. So technically, it's like illegal school, but they're not like illegal um, by definition because they are recognized by the district of of Mesot, you know. Um, but they are not allowed to register as a Thai formal school, as like not as like a private school. Uh, so we have about 60 migrant learning center uh, right now on the border of Thailand and Myanmar, which is um, which is a lot of, of, of center. But not, for example, one school used to have about um, 300 students, but because of the conflicts in 2021, so the, the number of students, you know, has been increasing. So some school, has about like from 200 to 600 students 
Um, so they're really facing challenges right now with a lot of um, like economic hardship. You know, they don't have enough like rooms. You know, some school provide like boarding school as well. So they don't have enough spaces for these children. They don't have like bathroom, you know. So most local NGO right now try to build all the bathroom for these schools. Interesting. I can ask you, we normally get into politics here, but do you have the political tensions in Thailand that we have in the U.S. concerning migrants not wanting to educate them or not wanting to, to kick them out and that kind of thing? I, I know you have a new prime minister recently, um, the daughter of the former prime minister. Is, is this a, an issue of real of tension in the government or is it or is the Thai um, government accepting and just creating curriculum for these individuals to try and get them um, you know, the best transition possible. So this is why Thailand, um, we, the, the Thailand and Myanmar border, that area is actually considered like economic special, special economic zone, we call it zone of exception. So basically the Thai government allowed the migrant learning center to operate, you know, to have the education system for this um, illegal, you know, undocumented stateless uh, migrant students because the Thai government tried to take that burden of, you know, of uh, their own system, right? So they allow this to happen. That's why we call it zone of exception. So the tension is that it's, it's very obvious during the COVID-19 um, when the school, every school in Thailand was shut down, including the Migrant Learning Center. Mm -hmm. So up until a year passed by, they allowed the, the Thai formal public school and the Thai private school to reopen the school, but the Migrant Learning Center were not allowed to open. Even though they follow all the you know, guidelines you know, provided by the Ministry of Health, but the Thai government did not allow them to, to, to operate at that time. So there, there was like a system, you know, systematic discrimination to the migrant community because they 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 claim that migrant people were the one who actually brought the COVID disease into the community, you know. Um, so um, that there's a tension between the well, so the Thai government really honestly like I don't want to talk too much politics, but they didn't seem to care, you know, um, to care about the migrant community. They think that they will I know there, there's like a humanitarian aid, you know, like local NGO, you know, international NGO already there to help these people. So they don't want to even bother to to do anything much at that time. Um, do I, my co host, want to jump in with a question or should I switch over to Andrew here? Would you like to add anything that what that, to what Moanita said? Yeah, just in terms of you know, your question about how migrants are accepted into the communities. Some of the, the work that I've been doing, work with Juanita and then um, with other NGOs there, uh, is on how migrants are able to access public education as well. And along the border, especially uh, at the Thai public schools, uh, you know, some of the schools have upwards of 80, 90%, mostly Burmese migrant students. And a lot, most, I'd say, yeah, probably most of the teachers don't speak for me. So like one of the, the projects that I was working on uh, in terms of doing a program evaluation and research on uh, was with an NGO that was providing classroom assistants who spoke for me that were trained and, you know, put into the public schools to help bridge that language gap for the migrant students and the Thai teachers. So, you know, to go along with the, so just, you know, your question of how are migrant children and migrant students, you know, accepted into the country, you know, their education is, is pretty perilous, especially when, you know, you know, kids that are four or five, six years old don't speak any Thai and they're in a school where, the you know, the teachers don't speak any for me. Uh, so there's, I'd say, not as much of an effort, you know, to, to really integrate them meaningfully into the public education system. Um, just, you know, contrasting with some other, you know, I compared it to the U.S. Um, but yeah, that's just one other sort of, uh, one element of it that, I, that I've looked at in my work, um, so. I know Chris has a question and I have a follow-up after Chris. So um, I'm wondering about the social emotional part of educating the migrant students. Obviously they've had a very rough time 
And I'm wondering if there are special needs that they bring or special aspects of your curriculum that address that? Well, that's something I can speak to that, Juanita. Uh, in the, at the Migrant Learning Centers, we wrote an article that compared the Thai public school curriculum with the Migrant Learning Center curriculum. And that was something we found with the NLPs is that they actively were including, you know, health and life skills, especially during, you know, the COVID pandemic in terms of health skills and really protection skills. So you're a migrant in this country, uh, you might be an undocumented migrant. So they would include in the curriculum, you know, specifically ways that children could um, uh, live in Thai society. And um, that was something we found that, you know, the public schools really lacked were those curriculum materials and lessons targeted at, you know, really helping to, to bridge that gap for migrant children that the MLCs really, really picked up. I don't know, uh, I know you were looking Juanita more recently or working with some of the MLCs more recently, but that was something I thought was really interesting um, that they included in their curriculum to, to really try and help the migrant students, you know, navigate life in Thailand, you know, as migrants, sometimes undocumented migrants. And um, I would like to add something too. As um, Migrant Learning Center were established as a safe zone for these children, you know, because they use their mother tongue language to instruct the classroom as well. So it's like that safe space as well. And also, like I was interviewing one of the um, teacher, um, one one school, Migrant Learning Center, and I asked them about their the student, you know, like social emotional. Uh, well-being of the of the children. So, like one of the teachers explained that the school has something that is called like a reflection box. I conceptualize that as a reflection reflection box. She said it's it's a box that the student can actually write their own feeling and you know write about their own hardship that they face at home or within their community, whatever they want to say, you know, and then put in that box. And basically, the teacher and the principal will actually read and try to like uh, come up with a solution, you know, and help them, you know. Um, go through like navigate the the challenges you know um, within within their own life and the community basically. So let's back up a second. Um, we haven't had you describe what your contribution is to these centers. What have you done? How has it been received? Um, how long have you been working on it? And have you worked one to one with some of these individuals? Do you interview? Um, some of the children that have come, come across and what have you heard if you have interviewed them? So basically my work, um, I didn't, I did not get a chance to interview the students or talk to, to the student. It was because the research was conducted during the COVID-19 and we were not allowed to access the community. And unfortunately, People in that community, the migrant community, they were not allowed to actually leave their community as well. Um, like I said, they were regarded as like a burden of the community, you know, um, rather than like their human resources, you know, for their labor, um, for their labor work. So I was, I had a chance to interview the teachers and also I was able to provide the teacher training uh, utilizing ut utilizing the textbook that Andrew and I design the curriculum, and they still struggling as far as understanding the concept of global citizenship education. Um, and I think in my work, I was talking about like how these people view themselves, you know, um, as a Myanmar citizen or as a global um, citizen. Um, so I mean, like it's it's like a citizenship dilemma. Um, for them, um, <clears throat> sorry, there seemed to be like a dilemma how like my grand teachers and the community identify themselves as a Myanmar citizen, a regional citizen, or a global citizen. But when it comes to like their like sense of citizenship, they view themselves as like a Myanmar citizen. However, they have like developed social cohesion and relationships among members, which promoted their sense of belonging, not only to the local community, but also to Thailand and the global village. So, and the um, the elements that I, that informed that sense of identity in, in this teacher was their values and their life experiences. 
that they have contributed to migrant education and their community has influenced influence them to see themselves as a global citizen. Um, so I was kind of helping them to find that sense of belonging, basically. I think they, they, it's so important because if you don't have the sense of belonging, you don't have that, that, that responsibility, like civic responsibility. You don't know your civic duty. You know, if you don't have the country of citizenship, you live in Thailand, but anytime you talk to them, they feel like they want to go back to Myanmar and develop their countries, but they don't want to go back to the country. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of conflicting in a way. Um, Wait so, a minute. Are these Thai teachers you're training or Burmese teachers or Th Myanmar teachers who are mm -hmm. living in Thailand? Myanmar teacher, basically, there are other um, ethnic groups as well, besides like Burmese. You know, we have like Mon, Kachin, Karen in the, in the school as well. Andrew, would you like to expand on that in particular? What's this textbook that she talked about? Yeah, so uh, we, we put together, I guess it was an entirely digital product because we worked on it, we collaborated um, uh, remotely. And yeah, I mean, the MLCs asked, you know, they wanted to include global citizenship in their curriculum. And they also, like I was speaking to before, wanted to have elements of the curriculum that were directly targeted at really helping migrants navigate life in Thailand. And yeah, it was a complex sort of activity thinking about what citizenship means and I think, you know, from an academic sense, this idea of global citizenship education, uh, it can include a lot of different elements, you know, political, moral, economic, cultural, social. And um, I think oftentimes, especially in, you know, America or, you know, Western Europe or, um, you know, in my experience here in the U.S., global citizenship can be very uh, critical. It can engage people with, you know, all right, how are the, what are the best ways of fighting climate change or you know, exploring things like that and implementing this idea of having people see themselves as part of a global community, definitely it took some adaptation to uh, you know, to write the curriculum for Myanmar, or sorry, for Thailand. There, there really weren't, Juanita, I don't think, any global citizenship education curricula materials that existed that were really meant for context of migration and, you know, where folks had been forcibly displaced and, you know, and migrated out of their home country. So, yeah, it, 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 we, we, we adapted materials that were, I'd say, more designed for the U.S. and uh, like the global north and tried to make them, you know, useful for, for the children in that context. Um, and I remember, too, at, you know, some of the initial feedback we got was from the teachers just saying, you know, this is some pretty like radical stuff in here. <laughs> and they, they didn't, they were, they weren't, not all of them were comfortable, you know, in class, you know, raising these questions of, all right, what does it mean to be a citizen? You know, what are your political views on the conflict in Myanmar or, you know, the political system in Thailand? Those were, you know, not everyone felt comfortable, uh, you know, talking about those things in, in the classroom. So it was, um, I'd say an ongoing project, uh, you know, thinking through, you know, what types of materials, what types of conversations make sense in those spaces and what are most useful at the end of the day for the for the kids. I know Punya has a question here, but I want to clarify. MLC is multilingual language classrooms or uh, curriculum? Uh, migrant Learning Center. Okay. Yeah, sorry. They're, yeah, the acronyms are always going <laughs> to, too many. Punya, um, jump in here. Oh, so, sorry, Winita, you have a comment? No. It's all right. I think like uh, I just want to say like within that context, like people often, you know, I mean, especially in the global north, people often think of a global citizen as like a privilege, which means if they gain a certain kind of education, it will make them become aware of the world around them and the possibilities that they have, you know, and they have tolerance towards other. But I, in my work, I argue that such a privilege in a way is actually incompatible with the definition of global citizenship in the contested context, because the border of Thailand and Myanmar is very contested. And some people become global citizen because of the need for survival, like those migrant children and their community and the teacher. 
So migrant students have to learn two or three languages and they have to find a job. They have to find a way to survive, you know, in that community. In addition, they have to navigate the complex identity with uncertain like legal and cultural status, you know. So um, I would say that the term as like human rights and global citizenship education as part of international discourse, uh, is naturally uh, not from the context of my grand student, you know, it actually comes out of necessity in some way within the context of Thailand and Myanmar border. So Punya does have a question. He wants me to ask it, so I will. Um, he asks, how do you make curricular decisions? If, uh, in a deeply chaotic context like this, for instance, school is more than citizenship, right? Are you also looking at learning as we more typically describe it? Uh, like learning in the various disciplines in science, math, and literacy, et cetera. I can jump in here. Um, for the curriculum that we worked on for global citizenship, um, we were, well, I guess you were approached, Juanita, uh, by one of the NGO directors who was, you know, heavily involved with running the school. And uh, like I, like we explained, they, they asked us to, you know, to make this curriculum that they could put in their school. And um, you know, in terms of navigating these different topics, I guess it was really an, an iterative process. So we wrote materials, we work with the NGOs and the teachers. Um, once we, you know, I, while we were writing the materials, you know, we had back and forth with folks to make sure we were including, including the right kinds of lessons. Um, and we followed up with teachers after it was used in the schools. And that's where we got the feedback in particular about you know, not everyone feeling comfortable bringing up these really contentious and political issues in these in these classrooms. So, and I would say, um, I'd say these are probably these are probably still going on to this day in these different, you know, in these migrant learning centers as they um, continue to operate. But that's a, hopefully a little, hopefully that helps answer your question a little bit. I don't know, Juanita, if you wanted to, to add on. Before I actually was approaching Andrew, I was uh, having a conversation with all the teachers Basically, they wanted us to design the Thai curriculum. This is because they want the migrant students to be able to speak Thai languages. Due to the high rate dropout, the dropout um, rate is very high. So they want the student to have life skill rather than learning from like, starting from like A, B, C, D, or, you know, the first alphabet to the last alphabet or learn about the sound. They basically, they want the content to be more, you know, um, teaching about life skills that so they, once they leave the school, they can utilize that knowledge in real life. So basically we integrate, um, integrated global citizenship education into the Thai curriculum. Uh, we added the content of global citizenship into the Thai curriculum. So basically they can learn Thai and have that global citizenship education knowledge within, within the text as well. Lydia is going to jump in here. Lydia? Thank you. Um, I think it's very commendable that you're developing this global citizenship curriculum to support these mig migrant children to develop a sense of belonging to this new country that um, they, to the extent they were forced to be in. I'm just wondering about this kind of like mutual development in terms of global citizenship that not just the migrant children are developing it, but also the local students from Thailand are also developing it because when I think about like a sense of identity, my belonging is not just what I think, it's also how other people look at me. And from um, the earlier discussion, you said the local community don't always welcome these migrant families and their children, sometimes even see them as a burden. I'm just wondering if there's any plan to also educate the local communities about uh, raise awareness and also to create a sense of inclusiveness for these um, newcomers to their community. So I actually happened to analyze the Thai curriculum within the Thai former public school, you know, on the border of Thailand when Myanmar, Andrew and I did that together as well. So I, um, we actually, um, this is why we have done the research on multilingual education as well. Then we know like how the curriculum was developed in the, in the Thai public school. The Thai public school on the border actually have 
more migrant population than the Thai students. So, so the Thai student within those school, they kind of like gradually learn that their school has a diverse population, you know, because they have become minority, you know, than the migrant uh, population. But the ironically though, the textbook still talk uh, about the migrant community in um, very negative tone. You know, like for example, if they want to give examples of like the crime, they would, you know, use migrant community as an example. So I think those textbooks need to be rewritten, you know, um, and, but that's not in like in our power so we can supplement it, you know, by like, usually we have like a meeting with the, the local NGO often have like a meeting with the parents, the migrant parents and kind of educate them. And then they can go on and educate their, their children as well. You know, um, and then not only the migrant parents, but the Thai parents are involved in that community as well. So um, that's why I think they do it through like um, community based education. Like we have the meeting within the community, we have a meeting together, you know, educate Thai parents as well, rather than like changing the curriculum, because that's so hard for us to do, you know, um, to, do, to do on that part. And actually, I can add on one more thing too. So the curriculum we worked on is for the migrant learning centers, the MLCs. Uh, the program impact project I mentioned earlier on the classroom assistant. So this was something we worked on where we were looking at the impact that multilingual classroom assistants were having in Thai public schools. And Lydia, to get at your question about, you know, impacting the broader Thai community, one of the findings from our study, you know, of investigating how these multilingual classroom assistants who spoke Burmese, uh, how they impacted, you know, learning for migrant children was that uh, we did some classroom observations and saw that there was much more camaraderie and interaction between the migrant Burmese students and the Thai students and with the Thai teachers. So, um, I mean, it, it makes sense, I think, if you just sort of think about it, of course, if, if folks can understand each other and literally speak the same language, <laughs> it makes a ton of sense that they're going to, um, you know, they're going to be able to interact more. And uh, we were looking at younger grades, just, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old students. Um, and simply put, they, they just became more friends, <laughs> became more friendly and had more friends. So that was a really nice finding from that, you know, study. Um, and yeah, again, like I said, it, it makes sense if you just think about it, folks can interact and speak the same language. Um, you know, we saw much more, um, I guess, positive vibe <laughs> with the Thai students and, and migrant students in, in the public school setting. Did you have a follow-up or a comment? No, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Before we got on the air today, we briefly discussed that this curriculum doesn't often often doesn't come out of thin air. That sometimes you utilize existing instruments, existing curricula, and modify it. And you had mentioned, and also in the blog post for today, the use of open educational resources (OER). Can you talk about um, OER and the impact that it's had on your curriculum development in Thailand? And what kinds of OER resources did you utilize that people who are listening or watching the show might want to access and take a look at themselves? Which have you found to be particularly accessible, usable um, in, in your own instructional, um, in your curriculum practices? Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, so for the MLC curriculum, uh, UNESCO has been a huge, has been a wonderful resource for finding, you know, openly available um, uh, materials, really. I don't know if they're necessarily designed as curriculum materials per se, but, uh, you know, when we look, when we did our, our, you know, academic study where we were coding the uh, curriculum materials at MLCs for global citizenship, um, we found that a lot of them were, you know, packets or uh, leaflets or, um, you know, different, you know, electronic PDFs about, you know, the COVID pandemic or climate change and that the MLCs had incorporated in their curriculum and that are freely available, you know, through the UNESCO and different UN agencies. They have a, a lot of great uh, materials. Um, and I know, I forget off the top of my head, Juanita, I know Myanmar 
has had some freely available curriculum We materials. have LearnBig. I just sent the link to everyone. It's called LearnBig. They utilize the LearnBig and the, you know, as Andrew explained that they use the UNESCO resources and also LearnBig during their, especially during the COVID-19, um, you know, because it's easily accessible. And not only that, um, UNICEF actually has provided the funding and provided the tablets to each market learning center. So they have the tablet that they can access to like LearnBig and the online resources and they teach you know, student through the through the tablet, but still it's not enough because they they have so many students and with one tablet, you know, so they they can't do much. Um, and I'm so, putting in the chat too. Right. Um, it's actually called the UNESCO Open Educational Resources. <laughs> so that's a great link. And another um, a place that we drew from was called Thoughtbox Education, um, who have some really incredible materials on social and emotional learning, global citizenship education, uh, well-being uh, that we use, uh, that we drew from uh, for the global citizenship curriculum that we made. <clears throat> I see the e-books in there. We have, we did have a session on Myanmar a couple of years ago on augmented books. I believe Chris hosted that session. Um, and uh, we also had a session with Dr. Paul Kim a couple of times to be on the show, he's worked in Myanmar on his smile project uh, for question asking using tablet computers, having kids ask questions of each other, increase literacy skills in Thailand. So if people are listening to this show and would like to access previous shows that we've had on Silver Lining, um, you might want to look up the ones that we've had in the past, uh, the one on Myanmar and the one with Paul Kim in the past. Um, Kurt, maybe... I just want to mention too, I just put in Mo'u, which is a, a wonderful resource for uh, Burmese language materials, M-O-T-O-O. -O. So sorry to interrupt, but I just oh, had no. to <laughs> put that in too. No, I've used a lot you. of their materials. They're great. And maybe if you could give me a summary list at the end, I can put them into the blog post. Oh, or perfect. Just, you know, so that people who are listening to the show who don't have a... <laughs> access to the links exactly. So um, it'd be useful for them to go back into the blog post and, and quickly access these. Cool, will do. Um, Lydia's got a question. Thank you. Uh, I was actually just looking at the website you just share uh, Motio and I was looking at like the teacher education and the resources for teachers. I'm just wondering like for your um, global citizenship, um, curriculum like what kind of have you run any teacher professional development and uh, if so how were they carried out and also just about teacher professional development in general um who are the teachers teaching in these um, migrant learning centers and what kind of support and resources um, do they receive andrew you want to go on that so so yeah, well, I can speak to the, for the global citizenship curriculum, uh, we did, well, I participated in online trainings, but I think Juanita, you were, you were there in person. So I know for the online trainings, you know, we went through, uh, you know, the, the, the goals of the curriculum, we went through the different, you know, the, the teacher resources, the student resources. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, we had that follow up where we got their feedback on, you know, how it was going. Um, but I know Juanita, uh, you were there in person and did a lot more of the actual work with the teachers and uh, could, could maybe speak also to generally, like what does a typical MLC teacher look like? What, what's their background, things like that. So the teachers who teach at the Migrant Learning Centers are, you know, um, people from the Myanmar, most, most of them. We have like, each school has only one Thai teacher, which is not enough because basically they want the student to be able to speak Thai and be able to, to live in that community and have that life skill, right? Because the language is so important. We're not talking about linguistic imperialism here, but we want them to be able to survive in that community, right? So most teacher are Burmese, Karen, majority Burmese, Karen, Kachin, and from Mon, 
Um, so those are like ethnic minority who are teaching at the migrant learning center. And, and so as far as like professional development, Andrew actually has been working with the organization called INNET, INNET, which is like inclusive um, development. What is it called again, Andrew? INNET. Oh, uh, Inclusive Education Foundation. Right. So they actually a very active organization that provide teacher training workshop all the time, like maybe like three times a year, just to make sure that the teacher understand the curriculum and know how to utilize their, you know, uh, pedagogical practices uh, within the, the migrant learning center. Um, but as far as our global citizenship education, we had we had just one training because we lack of um, financial resources. We have we our books were published and sponsored by the organization called uh, Save the Children. So every school um, got the textbook. We have the teachers' resources and the student workbook. So both teachers and students get the get the textbook as well. And, um, but because like I said, we, we lack of resources. So um, I think a few months ago, I was um, uh, approached by one of the migrant teachers. He asked me, do you have more textbook? And I said, okay, I'll check with the organization who actually, you know, funded this project. And then I asked them, they kind of like, they don't have enough, but right now they cannot produce more either. So I, basically send the online version to them, um, to the teacher, or I just go to the, 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 the publishing company, then, then I publish them myself and send to the, to the teacher. You know, I do what I can, I can do basically. Uh, and, but we actually trying to redesign the curriculum because I, after I have been speaking with the, my grand teachers hear their reflection and their feedback, there's a lot of things have to be changed on that curriculum. And I think it's so important to, to hear their voice and change the curric curriculum to be relevant to their life and how they utilize their pedagogical practices, you know, for, for this curriculum as well. Absolutely. Sorry if I... I just have a quick, yeah. quick, like, and simple question. Are these curriculum written in Burmese language? Like, do the teacher also speak Thai or the PD conduct it in Thai or in English? Like, just a basic uh, question about language. So at the Migrant Learning Center, the, t the textbook are published in Thai language. Like I said, they actually main purpose for designing this curriculum is to design the Thai curriculum. They want the student to be able to learn Thai. So it's actually published in Thai. The teachers are Thai, but the, there's a lot of challenges that we face because some teachers, they are not like Thai citizen. They're not born and grew up in Thai, in Thailand, but they can speak Thai. But the textbook can be very, like Andrew mentioned before, radical and critical. So like certain texts can be very difficult for them to, to comprehend, to understand. So they themselves are struggling to understand the, the text. And so basically they have other like Burmese teacher who can help translate the, the text within the textbook. They work together. But that's this doesn't really happen all the time because their lack of teacher um you know resources right now. Right. I'm a little confused because earlier you had indicated that there were Burmese teachers or from Myanmar. Now you're saying they're Thai teachers. Are they migrants themselves who've come across and become Thai citizens or no, but no, I, the most mo majority of the teachers are Burmese. Karen Kachin Ray right, from Myanmar, right. but because the Migrant Learning Center has a Thai curriculum as well. So they required by the local NGO that they must have one Thai teacher within that school. Actually, they want more, but it's so hard to find the Thai teacher who are willing to go teach in that learning center because they don't get paid a lot. So there is one Thai teacher who is dedicated to teach just the Thai Thai subject, Thai language, Thai curriculum. But because they don't have 
in our Thai teachers, they utilize the migrant teachers who can speak Thai to teach that Thai curriculum as well. And, and most of the MLC curriculum is in Burmese, right? Most of the subjects and most of the so materials it, are in Burmese. So there are three main curriculum within the Migrant Learning Center. The first one is the Myanmar curriculum. The second one is the uh, Thai non-formal education. And the third one is the Myanmar non-formal education. There are three main education pathways in Thailand. And the migrant student can access to Thai former public school, and they can access to migrant learning center. They can access to the private school. These are three educational pathways that migrant learning migrant students can have access to education. So I've been to Thailand in 2006, 2014, 2017, and I'm heading there in seven weeks. The internet access in the country has changed rapidly during that time in the past 18 years. When I was there in 2006, both in Bangkok and Chiang Mai, we we're using dial-up <laughs> access and we are as iffy at that, you know? I mean, I was slow, slow, slow. And I, you know, half the time it cut off and I wasn't connected just to check my emails and so forth. Um, and so I'm wondering what the state, uh, what, what the, I shouldn't say state, what the situation is like in Thailand in terms of technology access for students to get educated. Is it pervasive? Is it one-to-one? -one? And is it different for those outside of migrant communities? Do these children who are in these migrant learning centers have inferior access than those in typical Thai schools? And is, are they trying to change that to make it more equitable to address the needs that they have? And to what degree have they addressed it during the times in which you've studied it? Has it changed? Has it improved? Is it still a serious problem or an issue that they're facing? Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of curious. And then, you know, not just access, but the, the technology training that the teachers get, um, is it sufficient? for them um, in those centers. If either one of you would like to jump in, whatever you know. Um, so the country as a whole, what's it like? So, so the, the country as a whole, I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, COVID-19 situation as an example. That's a big digital divide in Thailand, right? So talking about Thailand, Thailand is a country that we have a lot of Thai public school and Thai public school, they don't have a lot of fundings. So what we faced at that time, and I was trying to help my professor get all of this, uh, you know, like um, iPads, you know, then the student can have access to education while being at their house um, during the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, most students at that time did not even have a cell phone. Like one's households, they have only one cell phone and their cell phone is they cannot have access to education to internet because they cannot afford to pay the internet connection. So I'm talking about the, the whole picture first in, the, in in Thailand, right? And so the, the student at the Thai public school don't have access to the internet connection at that time because their parents, most of them are underprivileged and, and they, they don't have you know, they cannot afford to pay for the internet connection and let alone to have a smartphone, right? So basically we have an alternative method by giving them like worksheet. Basically the teacher would go to their, the student's house, like home and give them the worksheets and student work by themselves at home. So, so when the teacher was trying to teach them online, the student cannot access, or they have one phone, and many students join together, but the internet connection was not stable. So, of course, there's a disruption for their learning at that time. And so, on the context of, of, of the border, it's not that different when you talk about the, the public school. So Migrant Learning Center is actually, the situation is worse than the Thai formal public school. They cannot, I mean, when you go there, you know, they don't even have a smartphone, each family. They try to survive each day just to have basic need. You know, we, we I actually went to give them 
um, relief effort. We provided like rice, you know, water, things that were necessary, let alone like giving them the internet connection or, or, or a smartphone at that time. So that's a big digital divide uh, in Thailand um, now. So the government, I mean, hasn't done much to provide their digital divide. It's actually, we like social movement, my professor, and also like the local NGO, we tried to get funding to provide at least the iPad that the school can have, you know, and then kind of alternate their learning. They can come to classes on certain day and and utilize the internet, you know, from, from the school sometime, you know, but it's, it doesn't happen all the time. So. You know, Chris has a question. Andrew, do you have any quick comments before we go to Chris? No, go ahead, Chris. Um, I'm going to involve Kunya in this as well. I know that ASU has a, has uh, resources that teachers can participate in uh, to learn how to do digital education on a global level. And I'm wondering, uh, both Punya, if if you can say anything about that, and also uh, if any of us know of other kinds of initiatives where um, teachers can get help uh, globally uh, working with digital education. Sorry, so I can uh, drop a link here. This is absolutely brand new as of this week. And Andrew, Vanita, feel free to drop me an email after the show's over. Uh, this is a series of, um, I don't know how to even, they're all in English though. So I think that's a constraint that you might have to factor in. But these are all kinds of different small power-ups, little kinds of lessons, ideas for professional development of teachers. The idea being, and particularly for people who are in the community who want to help with education, but do not necessarily have the training to do so, but also don't want to go get a complete degree because they don't have the time or the resources to do that. Um, so this is honestly just became public this week. This has been in the works for almost two years now. Um, so uh, that might be something that might be um, useful for you to look at. Um, and and the idea is to form like partnerships uh, with these. Uh, and I think there can be like discounts and so on. Many of these are self-paced, are free. Uh, there are other ones which are, you know, you can have somebody who can grade the stuff if you're interested in a certificate or some piece of paper that says you completed it. Uh, and then there are those which are instructor led, which then, of course, you have to pay more for. Right. Um, but there is a variety of different models there. And I know there are people here who I can connect you to um, uh, who, who would be very interested in seeing if they can help in any way. So thank you, Chris, for bringing that up. That was sort of back of my mind, but it hadn't really surfaced. So thank you. I, you know. Uh, follow that link, take a look at it, but drop me an email. I think the, that's the more important thing. This is being built as we speak, right? And so um, I'm not sure that all the possible use cases have been explored yet. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so I'm, much. Uh... I'm, I'm I'm clicking I'm clicking around right now, but we'll. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like we'll I stop. said, I mean, this you might end up in some kind of a 404 not found page. I wouldn't be surprised, just because this is literally being built as we speak. Um, but if you look at the number of resources that are already there, I think this has been a big sort of mission from our dean in particular to how do we expand the educator workforce, right? Um, and typically it has always been go get a four-year degree, get a certification, go work in a, you know, do the internship and so on, but recognize that that is not necessarily the path for most people who want to help out uh, in educational context. Um, so, you know, and I, and, and I can connect you with Gina, she is, she is great. And then, you know, we can, we can take it from there. That's awesome, this is really great. And I'm curious, Punya, like I know, um, as Juanita mentioned, most, I'd say if not all of the Thai public schools have, have Wi-Fi. Um, I know not all of the classrooms will have like projectors or things like that to use, but um, a lot of the, the MLCs in particular um, might not have access to, you know, stable internet throughout the day or projectors or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tablets or things like that. Are these, is this, you know, learning hub here for digital education? Are there resources that folks could use in classrooms that don't have Wi-Fi or those, you know, yes. or the, so, the hardware? 
Absolutely. So the the idea is, I mean, you'll see there will be things on like reading on how to teach literacy, how to teach math or STEM. Those don't depend on technology. So the idea here is not, this is just a medium of transmission. There are courses on technology integration in there as well, but a lot of those are about classroom management, social emotional learning, or, you know, so think about the, you know, like at, at a teacher's college, we offer a variety of courses, many of which, you know, don't necessarily, are not Technology is not integral to their delivery, right? The the content. So the idea here is for you to be able to take those classes in micro sort of formats or different kinds of formats. You can then stack them up and it can become a degree or a certificate, but you can choose not to. So for instance, I have uh, co-developed a series around AI and creativity and augmenting learning. Um, those will definitely need some technology if you want to implement them, but you can take those classes um, and you can take them in any mix and match format that you want. We've broken it down. So we have taken a nine credit, what would be a certificate, broken it down instead of like three credit, three credit, three credit courses into one credit, one credit, nine of those. And you can take any which time you want. You know, So it's not even that you have to do it necessarily in a sequence. That was like a big design challenge for us that how do we create curriculum that that allows people to dip in uh, with the idea that we make that so interesting that they want to take all nine of them and then get a certificate, but that's down the road, uh, you know, so on. So no, you don't, for many of them, the application of these in the classroom context does not require technology. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and I saw earlier one of your questions was about what, what keeps folks going and um, you know, despite the challenges in these places and, and context, and it truly, it's, it's the work of great people having resources like this. You know, Juanita mentioned the Inclusive Education Foundation, there's Help Without Frontiers and Child Dream Foundation, so many NGOs and, and teachers and, and people like yourself that are, you know, can help bring, help get these types of, um, you know, resources to, to the teachers that need them. And, um, so, so, so yeah, I, I, this is really great. We'll definitely share these with the, the, the different organizations that are doing teacher training for the MLCs. Um, I know, yeah, I know that high public schools have more of a formalized high teacher training um, that I, I haven't been really involved with, um, but this is great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, sure. And I'm going to drop another link. This is ASU uh, Rao has sort of redesigned itself. Um, along what we call three enterprises. So there's the academic enterprise, which is sort of the typical degree granting. There's a knowledge enterprise, which is sort of the research and new knowledge kind of stuff. And the third is what we are calling the learning enterprise. The idea being that, you know, that, and, you know, Chris has a whole book written on it about the 60 year curriculum. You know, the idea that, you know, that learning happens from when you are born till the day you leave the earth right so so then how can asu become a resource for learning across that and understanding that most people in that spectrum are not going to require a degree right yeah. and so one of our commitments has been to develop a a, a digital school a k-12 school so i'm going to drop a link to asu prep uh, digital so we run a whole bunch of schools which are physical schools but we also run this digital school um and again like i said drop me an email these are deeper conversations to have. And again, I don't speak for these individual groups. You know, I can introduce you to the right people and, you know, who knows, uh, good things can can emerge out of that. So this we're is, getting this is close. The... Go ahead. I was just going to say one more thing is, I know that Juanita mentioned it earlier, but, um, you know, recognition and credentialing is a big issue with a lot of, you know, informal non-state schools. I know a, a few of your previous episodes, that I know you've spoken to folks that have, been in like homeschooling, private schooling, and this is something we see here too, where, um, you know, degrees or credentials that students get aren't always um, recognized. And similarly, for teacher professional development, um, we'll see the same, uh, you know, same challenges. So I think resources like this where folks can access, you know, micro, or can actually get micro credentials that might lead to something more, um, seems like a really interesting way to, to sort of get at that challenge as well. So that's uh, just made me think of that. So thank you. Thank you again for sure. sure. So I have a final question. Puya and I both have, but before we get to that, um, uh, Andrew answered what, what inspires him, what challenges we needed. We didn't hear from you. What inspires you in spite of all the challenges, political, social, cultural, and so forth, to be in the space in 30 seconds or less, what inspires you? <laughs> 
Okay, so global citizenship education is all about emancipation, you know, giving that freedom. So if you don't give access to education to these children, if you don't try to face the challenges, they never get out of that refugee camp. They can get stuck in there for the rest of their life. So this is why we are trying to work so hard to with the local NGO, international NGO, to make this to to have access to education for these students. And and even the teachers themselves, they they need to be liberated to be from being marginalized, you know, um, from they need. So in my work, I, I I did write something that I came up with my own framework and I call it I, I am a human being to education because in Thailand, most migrant people often feel like discriminated by the Thai people. They always tell me they're like, I, I'm just a human too. Like I'm just a human being too. Like why would they treat us this way? So I think we need an education that is called I am a human being to education that prom problematizes education being deemed as a threat to human dignity. In fact, we don't need any like prefix. We don't need social justice education, global citizenship education. Only if it's already education by itself already provide all the elements that promote the sense of being human. So. We should have started with that, but it's a nice way to end. Um, we also want to know quickly, how can one get involved? What conferences are out there? What, what ways can one become part of the community? How can people help? Um, how can one be feel like they're a member of this? Be like Andrew, you reach out and you're willing to volunteer. You know, we need a lot of volunteer, especially people who can, like all of you guys, especially talking about digital literacy, we need a lot of that, you know, within the community. So and Andrew in 15 seconds or less. Yeah, we'll put some links to the different organizations we've talked about in the show notes and yeah, reach out. That's how we met. It was just an email. So yeah, if you're interested in this email, reach out. Um, We'll make it happen. <laughs> well, we've really covered a lot of territory during the past hour. It's been a delightful show. I want to thank you for coming in here uh, today and, and enlightening us as what's happening in, in Thailand, in particular in the northern border with Myanmar. Um, Lydia, Chris, or Puny, you have any final comment before I introduce the next show? No, thank you so much for joining. Uh, always, I... I at the end of so many of our episodes, I come out feeling so humbled uh, at, at having spoken with people doing such amazing work. So thank you for that. My email address, I just dropped in there. Uh, just drop me a note saying hello, and then I can follow up. We can follow up by email. Thank so you. We're hoping the next show heads down the road to Malaysia, talking about democratizing and accelerating AI and machine learning to upskill the digital workforce at May Bank in Malaysia in particular. We might also get into issues of of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and building an inclusive workforce that's ready for the 21st century at 8 p.m. Eastern time. This is, this is tentatively set up. It's not official yet, but that's the hope for next week, uh, Saturday um, on the 31st of August. <laughs>